Hey everyone, my name is Vish. Um, I work at FAIR in London. And this talk is about building a large scale uh, scene text recognition system at Facebook that um, it handles more than like a billion images per day on over about 100 different languages. So I will talk about the challenges that we encountered as well as the lessons learned in the process. Um, so, but before that, what does scene text recognition mean? It's like OCR, but not quite. Our goal basically is to extract text that is overlaid on images, or it could be part of a natural image itself. Um, and why do we need this? Because a lot of content these days, especially on social media platforms, gets spread as text on images. And being able to understand them allows us to improve things like have, say, like better photo search, um, or improve the experience of screen readers for like the visually impaired and even identify any policy violating content that might be propagating as text on images. So when we build a system like this, there are a few major challenges that we would uh, encounter. Um, specifically, you want your object detector to be highly accurate. So if your downstream application is image classification, right? And if your object detector is, um, shoddy, then, um, and if it just gives you like half an image of a bulldog, then the image classifier still can categorize that as a bulldog. But we can't quite say the same thing in the case of text because it, it changes the meaning entirely. In addition to that, text on images come in various sizes, fonts, orientations, and so on. And if you hope to build a global system, it has to handle a large number of languages and if it's an online system, it has to be highly efficient as well. So our architecture of the model looks like this. So essentially, we have a two-step approach. First, we have a text detection system that takes the image, and it identifies the locations on the image where the individual words are actually present. And then it takes each such word crop, and it feeds that into a second model called the text recognition model, and that does the actual transcription of the words. So the text detection basically uses a, this model called uh, the faster RCNN, and this works by having a convolutional neural network. It extracts the features, and on top of that feature map, it applies a sliding window where at each location on the feature map, you basically try to create these things called anchor boxes. These are boxes with different aspect ratios and sizes, and you try to predict the probability of there being a word or an object for that matter at each of these um, you know, points. And then you rank them. Um, and we, we care about efficiency from the beginning, and object detectors are typically super expensive. Um, so one first step that we took in this direction was to replace the default ResNet convolutional feature extractor with the much more optimal ShuffleNet extractor that's been built mainly for like mobile devices. And it uses these things called the depthwise convolution that um, only works on a subset of the input channels from the previous layer. So this is good so far, but all object detectors that have been built classically, they only give out horizontal boxes in the image, and text appear on images in various orientations. So this is not, uh, it's not gonna work entirely for us. Uh, so uh, we improved upon this architecture by modifying the anchor boxes to also output various orientations at different quantized angles. And with that approach, um, it's been able to work well for us. So that's the object detector. In addition to that, after we have the word crops, we, we basically want to get the text. And we want to do this in like a large number of languages as well. So the model to do this um, is as follows. So you basically have the word crop from the text detector. Um, and then you feed that to a convolutional network again. And you get a um, like feature map again. And you actually resize the input crop such that the output of this feature map, uh, its, its height gets squished down to one. And the width over here, that's the number 16 over here, that corresponds to the width of the word, really. 
And this feature map then gets fed into a recognition head that takes these 512 channels and it creates like a probability distribution at each time step over all the alphabets that you have in the language that you actually care about. So if you are building a text recognition system to just um, identify and recognize the lowercase English alphabets, then this is going to be, um, it's going to be 26 um, there, over there. Um, and then it gets fed into a decoder. And in our case, the decoder is actually a connectionist temporal classification loss. And what that does is, it's, it's, it solves an alignment problem. So say you want to recognize the word hello. It has five characters. And the previous slide, we saw that the width of this feature map is going to be 16. Now, there are multiple ways in which you could get the word hello by aligning these 16 different spatial locations. The job of the connectionist temporal classification loss is to basically compute all these paths by using dynamic programming, add up the probabilities, and then do the back propagation quite efficiently. And during inference time, we just use a greedy decoder or a beam switch decoder. Now, how do we scale this to a large number of languages? Well, the naive way to do that would be to simply have a different model for text recognition for each language that you care about, but you know, it's obviously not scalable. Um, and you could do something like this, where you have a shared feature extractor and you have a different head for each of the languages. Um, and that would be the most obvious thing to do. But surprisingly, we found that just modifying the original architecture that we have into a system where you modify the probability distribution in the end to encompass the characters of all the languages that we care about works quite well as long as you have extremely good annotated training data. Now, talking about the training data, um, often for languages like English and so on, um, as long as it's based on the Latin characters, it's easy to obtain annotated data. But say you want to recognize Klingon, right? Like, you know, where would you go find annotators to actually create a large data set for this? Um, so we faced this problem for a bunch of languages. And we found that actually artificially generating your own data set by having text overlaid on images and then pre-training your model with that works quite well. So this, in this graph, the blue line over here shows the accuracy of the text recognition model. Um, as a function of the size of the Arabic data set that we had. The green lines, it shows the same thing, but in this case, we pre-trained the model with the synthetic data set um, of Arabic um, text on images. And you can see that if you have a very small manually annotated data set, then there is a big difference in terms of the accuracy to be obtained if you were to do this kind of a synthetic data set pre-training. All right, uh, with that, we have the models generated, so now it's, it's time to deploy it. But object detection systems are actually super, super expensive because um, to obtain high accuracy, you need a large, uh, you know, like, um, yeah, I mean, the input image resolution has to be quite large. It means the activations need to be quite big. Um, so at every layer, you read and write the activations from the main memory and back, which means your system is entirely bottlenecked on the memory bandwidth of, uh, of the servers. To fix that, we employed this technique of intake quantization, where after you train your neural network based on 32-bit floating points, you actually convert the weights and the activations to, uh, you know, to just 8-bit integers. And that gives you a four time savings in terms of, the, in terms of, uh, like, in terms of like, the memory usage itself. And then you do all the computations based on intake uh, itself. And the way in which you do that is, you, you take each weight tensor or each activation tensor inside any large neural network, and you perform a linear mapping by doing a scale and a shift. So you might take a tensor, and, and you might map the smallest value in the tensor to, say, like, you know, minus 128. Um, and you might take the largest value to, uh, like, uh, in fact, like, uh, in this case, plus 127. And with that, you compute the scale and the offset. And it's important to note that 0 um, hit floating point needs to be exactly mapped to an actual value in intake because um, if you have any rounding errors there, then that would get propagated throughout the network because zero is, um, is, is present in a large number of places inside the weights and activations of a neural network. 
And then you do the um, actual computation, in this case, the matrix multiplication entirely in intait. So here you have two matrices, you do intait matrix multiplication, and you accumulate the intermediate results in, in 32, um, and then it gets requantized back into intait on the output itself. Initially, when we tried this, there was a big gap in accuracy compared to the baseline performance. Uh, and we did a few things to actually bridge this gap. So first of all, um, it is possible to merge the consecutive convolution and the ReLU layers of a network because these things always occur together. And that helps because ReLU sets a bunch of values to zero um, in, in any given tensor. And by doing that, you are squishing the range that you care about, and that minimizes the uh, error that you would obtain uh, if you perform uh, this quantization step itself. And another thing that we had to do was that uh, we avoided quantizing uh, the first layer of the network because that is extremely low, uh, it's highly sensitive uh, to like the accuracy itself. Um, in addition to that, um, yes, all of this saved like the memory bandwidth, but to, in order to get further CPU speed ups, we had to perform the step called this outlier aware quantization. Um, where you actually accumulate the intermediate intate multiplication results in 16 bits as opposed to 32 bits. Um, but when we tried this, this wasn't, we actually found a big drop in, in, in the accuracy of the model itself. And we found that this was because for specific layers in the ShuffleNet architecture, the convolution was not followed by like the ReLU layer. And the implication of this is that your um, activations are not sparse which was needed by this specific optimization. And just by adding ReLU to this specific, uh, you know, to these specific layers in, a, in our architecture and retraining the model and then performing uh, the quantization step, we were actually able to, uh, uh, imp yeah, so we can improve the performance itself. So the lesson here is it's important to co-design your model, um, you know, together with, you know, with the systems optimizations that you actually care about. So with that, we were able to obtain a big uh, drop in the total latency that was incurred by the model itself, as well as a big jump in the total throughput of, of, of the system. Um, and the important primitives where you can run the intake matrix multiplication computations um, for each of the layers has been open sourced as part of PyTorch as well. Um, and with this, we were able to go from you know, basically nothing to handling more than a about a billion images per day um, in about four months. Um, so the takeaways really are, first of all, it's important to spend more time on the data as opposed to the optimizations inside the model because, um, you know, as in the case of the text recognition system, if you have high quality, um, if you have high quality data um, and if you have a very simple model, then it might just work in most cases. And if you can't get really good data, then you might also try, uh, in fact, synthesizing your own data sets. Um, in often cases, that might work quite well. As, um, and, and the last point is that um, if you care about running your systems online in, in any um, real fashion, it's important to actually think about optimization uh, from the beginning of the modeling step itself. Um, since these two things often go, in fact, like hand in hand. Yeah, so that's it for today. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Fish. Fantastic. Stay on stage and we'll see yeah. if we've got some questions from the audience. Please do raise your hand if you have a question. We have some roving mics. And if I could ask you, to, we have a question in the middle, just here on the left-hand side for the person running up from the back. Yep. Just getting a mic to you. If you could stand up in your white shirt. And if you wouldn't mind just holding the mic close to your mouth so we can hear you. Thank you. Hello, my Hi. name is Ivan, and I have a question. When you said uh, that you use uh, uh, eight, how do, you, how do you call it? Eight, do round to eight. You said yes. that yes. you did not do it in the first layer. Do you think uh, first layer from the beginning or the last one from, or first from the end? I did not get it. Yeah, uh, it's actually the first layer from the top of the network, so the one that actually operates on the input image itself. Um, and, um, and that's mainly because you have a lot of information on the, on like the original image and you don't want to throw away by doing like the quantization uh, approach. And another thing is, 
you don't lose a lot of performance by doing it because the input image only contains three channels. It's RGB. So it's much smaller compared to the activations that you would see later on in the network. So it's, it's a good trade-off there. Yeah. Fantastic. I believe there was another question in the middle section. Did anyone else have a question? Over here. Here at the front and then one in the middle uh, just after. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the great presentation. How many words do you use, and how many, uh, what's the volume of data? And you said um, when you have lack of data, you synthesize data. So what's actually the, the you know, definition line? Yeah, that um, ends up depending upon the specific model and the size of the model itself. But typically, um, oftentimes, if you have a good base network that's been trained to, you know, like, uh, in, in fact, like generalize well. And then for any new language, about a few hundred images is actually quite sufficient. And when you can't do that, then you might go about um, artificially generating your own data set as well. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a question just in the middle there, sir. Uh, OK. So what about uh, non-standard fonts, like handwriting or captchas? Does yeah. it work? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And um, as is always, the answer in AI, like it depends upon the training data that we have. Um, and we found that it, it works to like in varying extents, but um, it's been, it's generally quite hard to get manually annotated data um, as well as images for like, you know, handwriting, handwriting systems. Um, so in, in this specific system, we haven't spent too much time on, on the handwriting data sets, but um, I don't see why the same system wouldn't work if you were to get the, uh, if you were to, if you can get high quality data sets for these. Fantastic. Any more questions from our fabulous audience? No? Well, with that, thank you, Vish, so much. I appreciate that. Yes. Let's give Vish a wonderful round of Thanks. applause. Thank you very much.